to the OC Bitches. Oh, yes. Welcome to the <laughs> OC Bitches. We are on, what, season three, episode 12, The Sister Act. And Rachel is still in Canada. I'm still in Canada. It's going to be a little awkward, but you know what? We like awkward sometimes around here. And I'm on a computer, but... I'm really happy that we are doing this today. We have a very special guest. We do. Today's guest is Deborah Hassenklein, Director of Drama Development and Current Programming at Fox Entertainment. Deb was born and raised in LA after attending UC Davis with a degree in English and film studies. She worked at WME, which is, for people who don't know, William Morris Endeavor, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, Agency in the book and TV department. Uh, She left WME to work at Fox and pursue her passion for TV drama development. Currently, she is point on a slate of development projects, as well as three current shows, The Cleaning Lady, returning for season two on September 19th on Fox and the next day on Hulu. The Resident, returning for season six on September 20th on Fox and the next day on Hulu. And Fantasy Island, returning for season two in the new year for a whole year in the regular season. And she is also an incredibly passionate fan of the OC. Welcome, Deb. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> I'm so grateful that um, I got I got the opportunity to do an episode of Fantasy Island. And once I um, I had done the episode, I guess, or I can't remember exactly when it came, but you sent me a message saying mm-hmm. how much you love the OC and the podcast and if we ever needed a guest... And I really, really am interested. This is part of, this this is the piece of the puzzle because we explore all the things about the OC, Mm -hmm. but there's a whole network executive side of it. And I love getting that executive point of view about how things work on a network level. Yeah. I'm excited to fill you guys in and more importantly, to be here. Yes. (laughs) So, well, I guess we should first start. Yeah. With, um... Like what an executive does, like what, how do you define what you do? So um, it's a little bit different at every single network. At Fox, my team is the drama team and we do development and current programming. So development is, you know, anywhere from a pitch or a script or an idea um, until it makes it onto the screen. So there are a lot of steps. And as you're both familiar with, things can kind of fall off along the way, but Hopefully those make it to series. And then um, that's where we kind of step in on the current side. So it's really, it's reading scripts, talking through with writers, trying to find the best version of everything that both feels like it's right for our audience and kind of fits the Fox brand and feels true to the show. So it's it's a very fun job. (laughs) Very good. Yeah, that's so cool to always hear the other side. Being a Fox executives specifically in the OC was a Fox show, (laughs) which is kind of funny. And, you know, we've said that you were a fan of the show. Um, What do you remember? Like, I guess when it was on, did you already know you wanted to go into this? I guess so, right? No. So OC aired when I was in fourth grade. (laughs) Okay. I was going to (laughs) ask. But it is part of the reason I'm in TV. So I was first aware of the OC. I actually have a crazy story for Mm -hmm. you. And I was going to tell you before, but I was like, I have to wait (laughs) for this. But I don't know if you remember (laughs) when the OC was first on. It was season one. You were in Studio City and CG fell in somebody's driveway. My daughter? Yes. Just and scraped her knee. And you went into this person's home and like, we, because it was my home. (laughs) Oh, thank you. (laughs) Um, and you guys hung out for a little while. So that was my first awareness of the OC because I was a little kid and my mom was like, yeah, go play with this three-year-old. Um, and you guys chatted. Oh my gosh. Oh, wait. Okay, so do you mind like where in Studio City <laughs> yes. was it? Uh, like Laurel and Ventura, like kind of like two blocks south of basically where Paper Source is. Yeah. Okay, so we would have been there and she scraped her knee. Oh my gosh, I don't remember this. I'm she <laughs> and she de- probably doesn't, but... There was a lot of friends. We had a lot of friends in there mm-hmm. because you went to Oakwood and grew up in the Valley. Yeah. So you totally grew up in the Valley. I totally grew up in the Valley. I did Oakwood for a couple of years. Oh, you did? Mm-hmm. Okay. And, she, and Rachel and CG both went to Notre Dame. Yeah, I was going to ask you where you went. Yes, I went to a lot of schools. Yeah, um, I'm I a Valley to, girl myself. <laughs> love the Valley. Underrated. Um, I went to Heschel, which is a Jewish school for elementary school. And you were going to be on our... Um, you We were going to have you on for the... 
Chrismica bar mitzvah yes. test, which would have been, you were, you were very excited about it, but yes. it didn't work out scheduling I went to wise. many bar mitzvahs and <laughs> faux mitzvahs, which is a bar mitzvah yeah. for somebody who's not Jewish. Oh my gosh. So like at Oakwood, because they they, mm-hmm. they oh have to schedule it to, so that nobody feels left out. And those CG probably would have loved that. Yes. Oh my gosh, that's so cute. So I did that. <laughs> and then I went to a school that's now called D Toledo for high school. Okay. Um, but at the time it was called New Community Jewish High School and people just called it New Jew. So I was <laughs> deep in the valley for school, but I uh, born and raised Studio City. Oh my gosh, yeah. So that's you and Rachel. You guys are like Studio City sisters. <laughs> Sherman Oaks. Could have met at the mall. That's right. That's right. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I was wearing I'm sure from... we did, but you were, you're were you much younger than I am. <laughs> Please. <laughs> um, but yeah, we, you know, so I was aware of it and it was a show I wanted to watch and wasn't allowed to. And then in like sixth grade, other girls in my grade started watching it and they would all wear like their OC sweatshirts to school on Thursdays during season three. And I slept at my grandma's one Thursday night and I was like, oh, I watch the show every week and I knew I wasn't allowed to watch it. <laughs> and it was this like Volchuk episode. And it was like very uh, scary. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it wasn't the finale, but it was, there was some like oh, no. fight with Ryan. Can't remember. And I was so scared and learned my lesson. Oh, really? <laughs> but then a couple years later, I started watching Gossip Girl came out and One Tree Hill. And I started watching those and I was like, oh, I, I guess I could watch the OC now. Um, and I binged it via DVDs that came in the mail from Blockbuster um, in eighth grade. Oh my gosh. And then you became <laughs> a true, true fan. You just told me that you had a poster in your office. I do. Oh, you do even right more now. embarrassing, it's in my kitchen. Um, <laughs> but it's um, it's like a silhouette surfer and it has like two taglines at the top. It says, it's nothing like where you've been and nothing like what you imagine. And then on the bottom, it says the best new <laughs> show of the fall is coming this summer. Something like it. a little chaotic, but very fun. I love it. I have a couple questions for you. But before we do that, is there still, when you're at Fox, do you guys still um, talk about shows of the past? That oh, yeah. Fox still, like, in because oh, so, it's like, you know, American Idol. We were American Idol and, and um, what was like on at the time? American Idol. OC. Maybe 24. 24, like Malcolm in the Middle, like those shows Mm -hmm. were kind of, and um, one of the things that I was going to bring up is that the show, it burned so, so bright at the Mm -hmm. beginning. We had so many ratings. And then I didn't actually get the numbers. Um, Gail Berman was the president of Fox at the time, and she was there from 2000 to 2005. And she announced that she was leaving to go to Paramount. And Mm -hmm. Peter Liguori came in and took over, who had been the head of um, FX. And the show, so the show, when she left, unprecedented that she left when Fox has was leading in 18 to 49 for the first time in 18 years. Wow! So she left at a great time. And Peter Liguori, who Ultimately, what I heard was said, it's just our ratings were declining, but it wasn't his kind of show. So he didn't renew it more past the fourth season, past 16 episodes. So I guess my question is, what's different then and now? We, I mean, I don't know if we, I think we got canceled something like we were sub 5 million viewers probably, which today would be good. It would be amazing. (laughs) Okay. I think we've learned that. Yeah. One of the oh, wow. episodes you guys mentioned ratings and I literally texted my whole team about it. I was like, did you guys know this is what the ratings used to look like? It's, I mean, it's I think our top difference. was like, I think our very, very top was when we followed um, American Idol, which was like their first year as well. I think it was max like 14, maybe it's 13 or 14 mil. That's insane. Right. Okay. We're now looking closer to like, I mean, Fox does really well across all of our platforms. And um, we have both live viewers and Hulu next day. So things are just measured very differently now. But also, if you think about it, when the OC premiered, there are four major networks. Cable was really just blossoming for the first time. And more people were tuning into broadcasts, especially live. Now, so many of our viewers, again, are even big fans will watch next day or a week later, or I know people who will, you know, wait to binge a bunch of episodes. So mm-hmm. it's really just, we measure it super differently now. Absolutely. I mean, gone are the, I mean, are, do the Nielsen's still exist? Yes, but it's a lot less relevant, at least how we're looking at things. Right. All because of streaming and the streaming services and everything else. So it's all different now. Totally. Man, we would have been doing really well <laughs> nowadays. We should bring it back. <laughs> hey, if you guys are interested... 
texted my boss ahead of time to make sure I had the green light. We can do it. Oh, <laughs> he <really>? said yes. <laughs> only Ben, only Ben and Adam say yes. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's that's the <laughs> get the whole crew. So speaking of Ben and Adam, since you started watching in eighth grade, were you Team Ryan or Team Seth? I was Team Seth. Um, rewatching, I think I'm a little more Team Ryan. Mm-hmm. Hey, that's me. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I grew up pretty Jewish and every boy I knew had like brown curly hair. So I was like, great. This is like the hot version of who I hope to be with one day. I love it. (laughs) But really to me, it was less about Seth and more about Seth and Summer and that relationship and how aspirational that was, Um, which obviously Ryan and Marissa had the passion, but it, they, they never quite, as you guys keep saying in the podcast, they, they never really live in that good moment. Well, that's actually a great segue to get into this episode, don't you think? Absolutely. Yes. Um, I'm going to read the synopsis. Okay. Marissa's sister, Caitlin, returns home from boarding school with secrets, lies, and a bag of stolen cash. Veronica Townsend has her eyes on Neil Roberts, much to Julie's disappointment. So the Coens and Summer concoct a plan to get Veronica away from Neil so Julie can have her shot. And... Johnny Tries to Distance Himself from Marissa, directed by Ian Toynton, written by Lila Gerstein, who created Heart of Dixie. Love Lila to death. Original air date, January 19th, 2006. Woohoo! And and Lila was asked to be on the podcast, yes. but she doesn't remember anything as well. So that's okay. It's not just you, Rachel, right? <sighs> She's like me. <laughs> yeah. So I love Lila so dearly. She is just awesome. So, uh, Deb, like you said, we have this very rare moment when the episode opens where Seth is looking for the pimple that was going to appear from last night and it's just miraculously gone. And he's saying everything is right. And this is, of course, Josh and Lila letting the audience know that here we go. Because I, because Josh, we know, loved the message board. So he's, he does all of these little inside things where he's talking to the people who comment that everything is perfect but that can't last in a show like ours, right? Mm -hmm. And he just goes through this very, very funny, silly thing. And then the doorbell rings and he says, piling bag of crap. I wonder if that was an improv. Because (laughs) it felt like one. Flaming bag of crap at the door. Yeah. (laughs) But instead, no, it's actually some of the best casting that the OCs ever had, um, kind of on par with... uh, with Autumn Reeser is Willa Holland, just all Britney Spears Mm -hmm. type. And some of the, I just love (laughs) this dialogue. I'm sure it was her audition, but she did it so well. And it was such a great opener because I don't think any of us knew what it was or the audience didn't know. Do you remember seeing that? Yeah, I had no idea. Especially since the actress changed. It was (laughs) for sure a surprise. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's a big, that's a big difference. Yeah. Well, and so we know that uh, Shailene Woodley was Caitlin before, and she was brought in to read again because oh, clearly they wanted this actress to be this, you know, from two years ago, uh, she's basically a mini Julie, we find out, because that's what Julie says about her. And they needed this very, I mean, and Willa was actually the, the, the correct age. She's 14 or 15 max, I think, um, at the time of shooting. And... Shailene was quoted as saying, yeah, Shailene was actually quoted as saying that I went through puberty a little bit um, further, further or longer, Mm -hmm. later, sorry, was the right word, than Willa Holland did. And so Willa was the right person for the job at the time. And, and it is true. I mean, I think at that time, Shailene was probably a little too sweet or girl next door. So the casting was correct because this Kate, this Caitlin is how do you say it? She is definitely like 14 going on 35. <laughs> definitely. When Secret Life aired in, what, 2009, she still, I remember, you know, she shows up pregnant, whatever. She felt very young. Still. And that was three years later. Right, right. Bedrooms have seen things. Things that cannot be unseen. Hangovers, dirty laundry. The 2022 Best Actor Acceptance Speech. Zykes. Oh. <laughs> if there is one room in our homes that deserves a little extra TLC, it's our bedroom. Article has everything you need to turn your bedroom into your best room. 
all for a great price. Think cozy beds, swanky headboards, and tons of lighting options to help you set the tone. So my bedroom, I actually have kind of a smallish bedroom, and it's the one place that I will not allow any clutter. It's my safe space, my sanctuary, and their classic modern timeless design is perfect for that sanctuary feel. Article is the easiest way to make your space look beautiful. They combine the curation of a boutique furniture store with the comfort and simplicity of shopping online. They offer fast, affordable shipping across the USA and Canada, quality shopping all from the comfort of your home. So my daughter is really into redoing her room and she's seven going on 18, naturally. So she wants all these very grown-up, cool-looking, you know, beds and colors and all of it. So we are turning to Article because everything is super cute, super fashionable, and super affordable. Article is offering our listeners $50 off your first purchase of $100 or more. To claim, visit article.com slash OC, and the discount will be automatically applied at checkout. That's A-R-T-I-C-L-E dot com slash OC for $50 off your first purchase of $100 or more. It's important to prioritize your mental health and wellness every day, because when you work on yourself, you'll start to see and feel positive changes in all areas of your life. The long-term effects of therapy can give you the tools to deal with challenges as they arise, strengthen your relationships, and give you a more optimistic outlook on life. There's no better time to invest in yourself than right now. Getting started is the most important part. There's no need to wait until something goes wrong in your life to work with a therapist. Of course, Talkspace is also there to help with any specific challenges you might be facing. It's the number one online therapy platform with thousands of licensed therapists trained in over 40 specialties, including anxiety, depression, relationships, and more. Your therapist can help you set and achieve your goals. Recently, I, I've become super committed and really taking the advice and implementing it and using it. And when you stay committed, it's astounding the results that one can get when, when you actually practice and, <laughs> and realize that we just don't know everything. And sometimes it's really great to listen to a, a licensed professional. Talkspace has thousands of licensed therapists with years of experience in over 40 specialties, including depression, anxiety, substance abuse, trauma, anger management, relationship issues, food and eating, and so much more. I could not be a bigger advocate for therapy. I'm also a big fan of convenience and the fact that Talkspace you can do anytime online. It's so convenient. And listen, everybody could use a little therapy. I'm just putting it out there. Talkspace is mental health care that meets you wherever you are. It simplifies taking care of your therapy and psychiatry needs because it eliminates the need to commute to appointments, miss time at work, or line up childcare in order to attend sessions. Plus, instead of waiting for an appointment, you can send text messages to your therapist and let them know the issues you're facing in real time. It's mental health care made easy. As a listener of this podcast, you'll get $100 off of your first month with Talkspace. To match with a licensed therapist today, go to Talkspace.com. Make sure to use the code OC to get $100 off your first month and show your support for the show. That's OC and Talkspace.com. Well, I had a lot to carry. She had to have, you know, some sort of, yeah, like seem older than her age and can handle all the things that kind of came along with her character. I mean, I remember at 14, I definitely acted a lot older than I was. And going back, now that I have a daughter, I'm like, that was awful. <laughs> and my daughter's going to be locked up until she's 25. But Willa really embodied like that whole package of what you wanted and needed to believe for this character, especially in this episode with her reintroduction. Yeah. And there's a moment there as a mom and an adult that I watch it and I'm like, ooh, cringy. The way she ties her shirt up and the way she's presenting herself and the boys have that. She's, I mean, she's just has no problem censoring herself or she doesn't censor herself when he's like, holy moly, Caitlin Cooper, you grown boobs. And the boy's reaction yeah. is kind of, you know, there's this moment where we're sexualizing a young girl. Mm -hmm. But kid you not, mm -hmm. I mean, you went to Notre Dame, my daughter went to Notre Dame, and those girls d would change their outfits. In fact, I remember there were passerbys that complained to the school about the girls walking down the street. 
Like, That's unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, you know, if you oh, ever well, went by Notre Dame. Uh, oh, yeah. You would get detention. Yeah, you would get detention for your skirt being too short. We all hemmed the shit out of our skirts. Yeah. And you would get detention for it if they were too short. And let me tell you, there was not much left to be desired. Mm-hmm. It was all hanging out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and when the public is actually complaining as they drive by, there's a problem. So it's not very, it's not unrealistic, but I love, <laughs> so then we go into Julie showing up going, where's my baby? And I love that the audience gets to learn. You don't understand. She's not going to like this because Caitlin is me. Marissa is Jimmy. Caitlin is me. But then when she shows up, mm-hmm. she's now preppied out. She's got the cute little um, braids in her. She's all dressed up mm-hmm. and she's, and we just getting a glimpse of this little master manipulator. She is well above. I mean, being relegated to a boarding school and, you know, and who knows what she's been exposed to all this time. Although I have this idea that they they prepaid with um, with Caleb's money for all these years because how is she going to a public boarding school anyway? I thought about that too. <laughs> right? Like, right. Julie's in a trailer. Yeah, in Montecito. Right. Which is, Kate is a real school. She's talking about Kate for, I don't know where Caitlin actually goes to, but Kate is actually a real school up there. But, uh, but I love that... Um, you know, they're trying to protect her from all this, but it's, she's so, um, as we get into this, we're just, she's, well, I don't need to say it all right now because you see it in the episode, how she just unveils how street smart or yeah. whatever's, whatever happened to Caitlin in the past couple of years, she has learned that the only way is to manipulate and dodge and, and be a puppet master for her own I guess, for her own wants and such. So so I guess then Julie instantly brings Caitlin to the trailer park. And oh my gosh. So I love when she goes, Tiffany Blue. <laughs> because we learned it's a real trailer that they yeah, rented. That's amazing. <laughs> and I have those pants that I was wearing. Yeah, they found the Tiffany, the one Tiffany Blue <laughs> trailer. <laughs> yeah, I wonder how long that took to find. I know, right? But then... I mean, pulling out that bed when she actually says pulling out that bed and she's like, and voila. I mean, that was part of the trailer. It wasn't like our art department had to fix that up. But I remember doing this and going, this is just insane. So funny. So and funny. Caitlin's like look of disgust <laughs> as the bed comes down. Right, right. Oh, and you know, something that's interesting about um, Willa, because I was trying to remember, because we got quite close and I got to know her family and such. So she's, her her stepdad was Brian De Palma. And then... Um, her other stepdad was e, um, Eduardo Baldi, E. Baldi restaurant. And, but her, her dad mm. is British and, you know, Misha's parents are British and they both have this kind of inflection in their dialogue and how they speak. And I thought it was, so she's just, she mm. came off really well as, as Misha's sister. I was thinking that yesterday, their voices are incredibly similar. Yeah. Right. It's like that California, almost yes. Valley, but with a British mm-hmm. influence. So they both had a similar upbringing in that way. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. Yeah, I noticed that too. I was like really liking the cadence to how, you know, Willow was talking. Right. The whole Caitlin storyline in this episode obviously is a big part of the episode, the biggest part. And I didn't know what to expect because like, you know, I don't remember anything, but she's so, yeah, she's Julie. She is a mini Julie. And you know, stealing the money and then the whole abortion story and everything. And I'm just like, what else is this girl going to come up with? She just brought up a scene that I thought was interesting. So, you know, when we, when, when this boy calls and we find out that she's stolen money from, um, he says that he's, she's stolen money from this fraternity and Ryan confronts her about it. She instantly tells this story about her friend having, needing an abortion that is a very highly skilled thing. It to, rolls right out. <laughs> well, and and it's a basically it's a way to make this yeah. to make Ryan feel so uncomfortable that he's not going to ask her anymore. You know, it's like how how do I get Ryan off my back? Let me say something super extreme. It's a really really um I guess skilled. She's like a grifter at this point. <laughs> it's <a> perfect lie, <laughs> right? And and by the way, that Justin is Jackson Rathbone. I mean, if you can't, we have so many of the Twilight kids in the OC that all went on to Twilight. We have Nikki Reed, Cam, Jugande. And Jackson Rathbone. And now in this episode. Well, and Melissa yeah. Rosenberg was a writer on our show and she wrote Twilight. So I wonder if that connection had anything to do with it. I'm sure it did. It. Yeah. 
I know from being on the network side, we'll often, you know, call back to people we've worked with before in love. Right. So that's how we ended up with you on Fantasy Island. We're like, you know, who who on Fox has been amazing that our audience loves. So I'm sure she did the same thing. Oh, I love it. Thanks. Thanks, Fox. (laughs) I can't wait to watch your episode. (laughs) It's fun. Is it? Well, yeah. Uh, The guy who, the gentleman who directed it, directed the Witch, Blair Witch Project, um, Eduardo. Sanchez, yeah. Sanchez. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, and we actually How shot fun. in the in the hotel that had been demolished and just after, you know, Hurricane Maria. So it was kind of creepy, I guess. Yeah, yeah. super creepy. <laughs> How fun. <laughs> I think it's important to know that this um, Justin character said she's 14. She told me she was 16. And I guess that is a big difference. Mm-hmm. But yes, she was, um, she, she is one of those girls that comes off. And this is why she was cast. She could play... 16, 17, 18, and, and get away with it. But she really was only 14 when we started, or just barely 15. It's, it's actually a really... <laughs> we haven't seen Taylor with Marissa. And when you guys get there and she just barrels in and you really see the dynamic that is the complete antithesis of Marissa and um, Taylor, where she's like, oh, hi, you're so, you know... What does she call it? Like, um, she equates it to leaving Nam. Yes. <laughs> I literally had to rewind to make sure I heard the line correctly. <laughs> yeah. And Seth and Summer refer to Taylor, like, with the abandoned puppy syndrome. <laughs> yes. Yes. And at the whole end of it, she's like, well, it's not as good as our group of friends here. And then what does Taylor say at the very end yeah. of that scene? She says something that, and but she's just very Taylor. And Adam just goes, <sighs> Like the big exasperated sigh. (laughs) Amazing. (laughs) Which is like his little improv, buttoning up the improv. There were quite a few Brody improvs in this episode. Well, I mean, I guess it's, you know, but I still, again, once again, I'm loving Seth and Summer in this episode. I think it's awesome. And, you know, so when Ryan runs after Marissa and says, hey, man, what's up? Because she's like, I got to go. She's like, it's just, it reminds me I haven't talked to Johnny. So we got to talk about the Johnny thing. And he's like, yeah, okay, you know, yeah. it's just so, we're, we're, I think it's not just us. It's, I think the whole audience was a little frustrated with the Johnny thing because it was dragging out and dragging out and dragging out. And when she, and then she's like, I want you to meet my sister. And, and, and that's a good way. That's for the, that's, the writers did that so the audience can see Johnny meeting the potster, as she's called in the next episode. We, we need Johnny to meet um, <laughs> Caitlin, right? Yes. Because Caitlin instantly goes after or recognizes, which is another thing, she recognizes that he's in love with her. Like immediately too. Right. I was like, no, 14 year olds mm-hmm. are smart. <laughs> well, yeah. and, and I guess this one is, she's like, um, she's like clairvoyant <laughs> or something. <laughs> but, and she has no problem saying, I mean, at 14, would you say, you know, so how long have you been in love with my sister? Like she's, she gets it. She's just lived so yeah. much life. Yeah, I like that there's the no filter. Totally. So I remember, I was like, okay, let's all think back to when we're 15 and doing stuff like this. Were we doing stuff like this? I remember meeting some guys, my girlfriend and I were in, um, we were 17, we were in Europe right after graduation. And we were 17, but we met these guys, but we told them we we were 18, right? It was maybe a few months away that we were going to be 18. But and then we we met them in LA and they went to UCLA and I was, oh no, I still had a year of high school. That's what it was. And I told them that I was actually 17. They booked out the door so fast. They were like, no, 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 no. I'm not dealing with you. <laughs> Did you ever do that, Rachel? Yeah. Oh, I used to steal or borrow, sorry, <laughs> other people's IDs to try to get in. But I look, I'm very, I'm short you know, and I look a little young, so it never went over well, but I definitely lied about my age many a time. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. The fake ID thing was kind of rampant. Yeah. I remember sitting in like a classroom and a girl like collected everybody and we all like took turns taking the picture. And then I got nervous and did not get the fake ID. (laughs) But nowadays, these kids, they can get a real one. They come from Asia and it has a strip on the back and it works and everything. What? That's crazy. I found that one out from from, you know, you know who. <laughs> the little three-year-old yep. who, tra- who sure fell do. on her knee. <laughs> the little three-year-old that skinned her knee. <laughs> on my driveway. <laughs> on your driveway. This yeah. is so awesome. 
So so funny. Oh my gosh. So she recognizes that, and then and then of course, in the same time, Marissa and Biz- and I love that they call Chili now is Bizarro Seth. It's a hysterical. That's a hysterical name. But she is told that look, he lied. There is no tour. He he did it for you. And then she goes to his house, right? Which actually, I'm going to give props to Ryan Donahue because I think this is the best acting he's done and it's the best scene for him where he flat out, he doesn't have to do anything. He's not overacting. He's just literally present and saying, yeah, I don't want to see you anymore. Because think about this. So like, what is really going on? You know, we kept thinking like, okay, she feels guilty about what happened to him. She feels like it's his fault. But I'm starting to think it, it's more than that because she loves Ryan. But have you ever just been like, there's people that you meet in your life and where you get something from them. Maybe she likes the way he makes her feel. She doesn't want him out of her life. But mm-hmm. it reminded me of, there was a, a time when I was, <laughs> you can't be friends with all the men. And it's like, yep. I wanted to be friends with Jerry Seinfeld, but he told me he couldn't be friends with me. And I can't be your friend, Jerry, uh, Jerry told me. <laughs> this is my favorite story, I think, of yours. That's incredible. <laughs> Because yeah, right? I mean, just like you know, <laughs> casually mention that. <laughs> yeah, what? <laughs> so I, I did his show, and then we were friendly. And then at one point, we were. I mean, he was just so funny. But I was getting married, and I was like, "I'm getting married. I can be your friend." He was like, "I cannot be your friend." And I was like, "Oh, is it like that?" And he was like, "Yep, can't be your friend." So I was like, "Okay, I guess I can't be your friend." This is way before he met his wife. This was like '97. But, uh, but yeah, so when a guy says, I can't be, thank God Johnny finally said, I can't, you need to go. I can't be your friend. My feelings are too strong and passionate. And she doesn't want to So you're saying it. Johnny is essentially Jerry Seinfeld. <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> but without the woe is me, he'd had a lot more humor. <laughs> Though really, Marissa should have been the one saying, I can't be your friend. Um, Because Johnny's the one who, and I'm not team Johnny, but you know, like he's the one who's emotionally hurting. He's put his feelings out there. She's not reciprocating. And it's kind of all over, all over again. She can't really let go to what you said. It's these people are giving her something that Ryan's not. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's something as, as, as an adult watching it, or I was an adult when I was on it, but I just didn't really think that deeply about it. But she, there's something that she's, because I think it 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 kind of explains Marissa and just who she is in her core and the essence of her is not because even Ryan's like when she tells him like first of all I love that they're trying to she's trying to find clothes in the trailer and it reminds me of remember Brandy Melville and it was just like a yes. mess all the time it was just like a giant pile yeah. of clothes yeah it's and I remember asking them I was like why is your store like yeah. this and they said it's supposed to represent a girl's bedroom but that's just the idea of these girls now all living, these three women living in this trailer and they can't find anything. But Ryan's like, he's so patient. He's like, why don't we focus on your sister's relationship or or, my, or me? And he does it with some kindness and, and she calls it a fight that they had. And I don't think it was a fight. It was just a very no. solid go away. A very solid go away. <laughs> <laughs> but he did he did some great acting there. Yeah, I do think there is truth to the, you know, even though Marissa is who she is, and I think genuinely she just can't help it. She wants to help, you know, the wounded bird syndrome and all that. But yeah, you you know, you're going to like attention from a guy like that, even though she's not playing it and it's not supposed to be that way. Every girl, come on, every girl likes a little attention. Yeah. Oh, for sure. <laughs> right. But it, it, but I think it, at some point we finally needed this scene that should have happened a while ago, but we finally have Johnny just going, no. Yes. And, but then, oh, he comes back to apologize. <laughs> and he gets, Ugh. and he comes, but he does I really it. struggle with this Johnny character. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> but he comes back to apologize and he gets Caitlin. And of course she says, well, why don't you come to the party? I'm inviting you. Because now she is pot stirring again. She's manipulating. But um, but it, but in the meantime, there's a dating business launch party happening, right? This, the Neil, Julie, Veronica, Sandy, Kirsten, like that whole storyline, I mean, is hilarious throughout this episode and the Seth and Summer antics. <laughs> it, it's, it's something, it's definitely the, my favorite part of the episode. I think it's so funny. 
I love that they made Veronica a sports agent because <laughs> that makes so much sense that she would walk in and instead of like, why does she have it out for Marissa? I don't think she really cares that much about Marissa, except that she wants something. So this is how she's going to use it because an agent, you guys have to deal with agents all the time. Right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> love all the agents. Yeah. But they they there's a way to to leverage what they want. And for her to say she's going to make Marissa's life a living hell and they're like and Kirsten's like what? Right? She's like you're going to hold a child hostage so right. you can get a date. Right, right. Oh my gosh. And then she calls her and Kirsten's like you called her li- little miss Columbine. It's like she's yeah, she's <laughs> But then Kirsten goes to Sandy, which I think is hysterical. And Sandy's like, we we don't take the threats like that. We don't negotiate with noobsies. As if he's saying we don't negotiate with terrorists, right? right. Which, same, same. <laughs> so, right. And then she's like, please. And this is a way to, you know, when Sandy calls him, I was like, oh, he's on speed dial. And I, you know, they have to add that because maybe he did it so quick. I was like, Neil's on speed dial. But that's... that's That was for sure a network note. I, I felt it in my bones. Did you? <laughs> that felt like something I'd be like, hey guys, this this doesn't feel realistic. Let's let's throw in some ADR and uh, make sure that the audience understands that they were on right. speed dial. <laughs> and that's, that gives you a little tidbit of info because, because they <sighs> apparently they play golf and it shows the audience that they're actually better friends, even though it feels like it's coming out of left field. Yes. That maybe they're better friends than, than they thought, right? Right. So when, when Sandy asks Neil and he says, do you know who Veronica Townsend is? And he says, I know every former A cup in town. Lol. Because I was thinking that yes. she was, I didn't comment on it last episode, but they were pow in your face. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's hysterical. The other scene that was hysterical was Autumn when she screams when you're in your living room and she screams running up and saying, oh my God, my mom and your dad are going to get set up and we're going to be sisters. And the look on your face is priceless. Yes. And then she has that I speak fluent housekeeper. <laughs> you know, how did you get Oh in? my God. I speak I fluent, know. fluent housekeeper. I don't think that one would fly in 2022. So many things that are said and I cringe and I'm like, yeah. I know. Exactly. I know. But then we find out when they actually go on the date, somehow she's charming. And as we see a slightly different side, but Neil, because he hasn't seen all the other stuff, but she finds him, he finds her charming. And then the next day she's just like, because it's not just the one date, it's the second date. And Cruella's little puppy. What was that funny comment? I mean, all of the dialogue. You know, the writers in this ep- in this show have such great dialogue. It's the yes. kind of dialogue I wish I could say in real life. I mean, it's amazing. Right? The, and it's all, <laughs> and I know you guys have commented on this, but it's also so specific to each character, which is why the show's so amazing because of the specificity. Yeah. Which makes it feel more universal. But it's like, right. you know, they're writing to you as the actors and they're writing to these characters and to this world and it's magic. Right, right. And you know, when he went on that date, <laughs> I forgot that Julie shows up and with Caitlin and sees him and instantly yes. gets a, like a uh feeling and and so then takes off. So that's that's an yeah, important Yeah, you thing. realize that you like Dr. Robert. But when Kirsten comes up and says, you know, how you doing? And she says, she says, well... I don't know, you know, she says, she, and she mentions that she found out about Dr. Roberts and Veronica. And she she lists off all of his attributes, like he's wealthy, he's got a house. Did she say he has a yacht or a boat or something like that? I think it was like pool and tennis court or, or something. something. It was like specifics about his backyard for sure. Which oh, shows yeah. you, yeah. yeah, okay. So it shows you <laughs> what Julie's brain, how she, but she's she's actually thinking that I like him because he's been so nice to Marissa. And if sure, he's got this, 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 and this, because that's the first thing Julie does Mm -hmm. is notice those things. And, but then she's like, but I really like him because, and she's having feelings for him. And Julie is still on this journey of trying to figure out what's attractive about a man. And that first thing is money for her. First, like four things. Mm -hmm. (laughs) First four things, right. But (laughs) But it was like, you know, I'm like, so she's still falling for that, but she has feelings because of him being so nice. So I thought that was just one more, like, slightly different thing than we've seen in the past. So I think Julie, Julie's become a very nice. And that's why we need Veronica. We need a good villain because Julie's been become a little too nice. Everything's too nice for her, right? Right. I agree with that. 
Yeah. But what I thought was so funny, so we have this whole thing going on and Julie's bummed and he's going on a second date with Veronica mm-hmm. and taking her to the launch party. And so when Seth and Summer, like we got to figure out how to, how this, to not, like not let this happen. And when Seth is like, tell, tell her he has genital warts. At first I was like, that has to be a Brody improv. Right. <laughs> but <laughs> apparently not. Cause that is what that, follows through to the end of the episode. Uh, no, I, I think they wrote it clearly. But when the scene where you guys are in Seth's bedroom talking about like, what are you going to do? Right? This whole, yeah. the, the words come up and then yeah. Sandy comes in and he's like, oh yeah, it's a one and done. <laughs> and you're like, really? I, I just love that the parents and the kids are in cahoots. Yes. That's that doesn't always happen. I right? so agree. That's my favorite scene of the whole episode. <laughs> and I wrote this down while I was watching that <laughs> I love teen soaps, but most of them, the parents and teen stories are totally separate. And when they intertwine, they're like coming at it from two different places. This feels so realistic. I remember like being in high school and a friend or whatever was over. and We're talking with my parents. We're all invested in the same thing that felt so normal. And I just... Loved it. You know what? You make, you bring up a good point that we've heard a lot of times that this was a show that parents were watching with their teenagers to just to, well, I don't know, to supervise, but they got hooked on it as well. Like totally. My, my dad was, you know, in his 70s at the time and he got hooked on it for not every season, but he did in the beginning. <laughs> That's awesome. But but going on with that scene where, where Kirsten comes up because Julie just told us she had feelings. She's like, oh my gosh, we have to figure this out. And then you guys, what is it that um, he says... What is he says something about hockey, and you start cracking up, Rachel. I think you were laughing in real life. Oh yeah, uh huh. <laughs> I was laughing in real life, and I was just reacting to Brody's yeah. improv, trying not to break up. You know, I always like to see it. What the hockey yeah. is what he said. It's really hard working with Brody all those years. It was very hard to not break yeah. because yeah. there was constant. Right. Things being thrown at you. <laughs> so when Taylor showed up, looking beautiful, by the way, everyone was like super curly hair in this yes. episode, I noticed. Yes. And but, a lot of swoopy side bangs. Yeah. I had to look up. Uh, Rachel, you had them. And <laughs> Willa has them. Super intense. Yeah, she had the whole... I, yeah. I still have them. <laughs> I got my hair cut like that, even though my hairdresser told me <laughs> it was not going to look good. And it didn't. And I wore headbands for like all of eighth grade. So. Okay. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, but then Seth does find Taylor and whispers in her ear what's, um, what we don't know. We, we think that it's, it's something that, um, Summer told Seth, we don't know what it is. And sure enough, she pulls Veronica aside and whatever it was, was enough for her to skedaddle because, (laughs) because Taylor wasn't feeling so well. And yeah, then, yeah. And then the the reveal is that he voted for John Kerry. I laughed out loud. At the time. (laughs) Right. Who was the Democrat. Yeah. Well, we would assume that being the Democrat and that if that that would be so shocking because Orange County is classic Republican, that that it would make her walk out. (laughs) And Seth goes, that is exactly (laughs) what I said. What? So we know that he actually used the wart line. Oh, for sure. (laughs) I know. And then Summer's like, you said genital wart, didn't you? (laughs) Punches him. (laughs) Well, Wait, does she, do we actually have the punch on camera? No, no. I don't, because later on, he's got this big welt, which I thought was like, I wonder yeah. why they didn't put it on camera. I punched him off camera, like <laughs> usual. Because I was like, that's a little <laughs> violent. Got to keep the summer rage issues alive, you know? Right, right, right. That's right. Hello. <laughs> I do not endorse domestic violence. <laughs> <laughs> not at all. There, Yeah, but there was, I have a, I wonder if, you know, that to me, that's funny because I have a feeling that in the message boards, people said, Summer hits Seth a lot. So this time, Josh and Lila said, okay, we're going to do it off camera. But Sandy tells <laughs> <laughs> Neil, he dodged a bullet and directs him to Julie Cooper and he asks her out. And they say, yeah, she says yes. So, and then Taylor's like, I we really, can still be really sisters. like Julie Cooper and Dr. Roberts. I know. It, it, def- definitely, I it know. definitely works on camera, yeah. doesn't it? And I like their friendship that's been kind of budding over the last couple episodes leading up. It makes sense. And especially since you didn't know Dr. Roberts, I feel like the writers were able to write him in a way that felt organic, but still makes sense that he would want to be a Julie. He literally is the character that seems 
you know, Sandy's kind of out there and he's still kind of a musical theater Jewish guy, you know, he's with all this big personality. But Dr. Roberts is like cool, calm, collected, um, no shaking hand surgeon, you know, like, and he seems to be like that in every bit of his life, you know, just very rational and more so than everybody in the show. So it's kind of a nice welcome to to this. But in the meantime, Johnny does um, come up to Marissa and they have a nice little, you know, thing. But she asks, she asks, mm-hmm. Marissa asks Johnny to take Willa, or sorry, uh, Caitlin home for ice cream. And they have a little combo in the car. <laughs> and she kind of, she talks about changing, that she, she says something about changing, right? Yeah, she says that line about like, you know, I never understood, is it that the place changes or people change? Right. And then she's like, the place did not change. Uh, oh, I, I thought you meant her clothes. <laughs> well, that comes after. <laughs> yeah, she's like it. She she definitely changed. And 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 then she has her has him pull over and whoop runs into the water. And Johnny's not in any way like excited about it. He's like, uh uh-uh. uh. He's like he's like this is trouble. Yet still goes along. Right. That's because like, he like... feels protective or something. <laughs> right. Or... I'm like, okay, you can say no if. Now, does she take off her clothes and run in the ocean? I think. I yeah. assume so. She Well, we didn't see that, but I have a feeling that that was what was going on. But that is our um, that is our little pot. I, she's the pot stirrer because she always will be. And by the way, any like little sister with their like older sister and their boyfriends or whatever, you know, there's always intrigue there no matter right. what. And that's obviously a little bit of what's going on. Yes. There's so many things going on. It reminds me of... There's so many. There's so many things. So you um, have been, thank you, a dedicated listener to the podcast and you know everything that we explore. (laughs) But it is one of the things that, you know, when we were on the air, Fox had had Nipplegate with um, Janet Mm -hmm. Jackson and we went from being able to do some things to everything being really, really tight in censorship and like they they cut out the word MILF. And, but things, how much have things changed now? I mean on Fox or just in network television. I mean, you have to compete with the cables and the streamers and everything. And, and I mean, when you think about like what Euphoria is doing on Mm -hmm. HBO, we're so tame compared to that or, or the OC was. Oh, totally. I mean, what can you get away with? Are you always pushing the envelope still? Or are there still some things that are just no-nos? I think somewhere in between, it kind of depends on what it Mm. is. First of all, there's like the actual rules that if, you break X rule, you'll get fined like an insane amount of money. So that stuff's all absolutely no. And that goes the same for all of broadcast. And then there's the stuff where it's like, oh, is this kind of pushing it? Is this too far? And that's where it's kind of, you know, usually ends up being a conversation between like my creative team and our broadcast standards and practicing team who's, you know, in charge of this and the writers. And is this something that matters enough to the, you know, creative of the show? If we don't have this, is it going to be, you know, not as strong? But Something we talk about with writers a lot when they're, you know, they've written more recently in streaming or cable and they're like, you know, what what are the rules here? What can we do? Aside from nudity and like, you know, pretty, I guess, a- aggressive cursing. The seven words. Yes. Yeah. There's, um, <laughs> you know, I think there's a lot we can do. There's a lot we can allude to. Mm-hmm. And we're never going to do euphoria. But also at the same time, I think a lot of our content, especially at Fox specifically, where, you know, we've always been kind of like that rule breaker and, um, you know, kind of the outlier since day one, we're always open to kind of finding the way to push the envelope. Right, right. Well, I, I remember, I think I've told the story where um, one of our, one of the gentlemen who was this, tech, what's, what's the technical term for the censor uh, people that have to actually... Oh, I don't know. Like the press the button? Well, no, no. Actually, well, as, uh, oh, practices and standards. Yeah, broadcast. Sorry. Broadcast. Yeah, BSNP. Yeah, that's it. So he, um, there was a gentleman that would come to all of our parties, and I had a conversation. But he was talking about the fact that when Luke comes to Ju- to, to the mm-hmm. door at, um, and says, uh, "Mrs. Cooper, you're total milf," it got through every script, and it, we shot it until the network saw it, and they had to send it to because Josh was like, "What?" Mother, I'd like to have fun with mother, and they were like, "Well, he." I remember him telling me that we did a test group, and it was ninety percent of the people set knew that it meant what everyone knows it means. And I was like, "What? We didn't know that." 
<laughs> so those things, um, I don't know. Could you get away with that word now? That's a great question. I don't know. I can like follow up with um, Katie after and let you guys know, but um, I'll have to ask our BSNP team. Right. They're right. very, a lot more diligent now, it sounds right. like, than then where it's, there's no way you guys would have shot that. Right. It would have definitely been flagged past before. The studio. Right. Yeah. No, it was one of those things that slid by. Right. There's so many things on the show watching it back that you're like, there's no way. Yeah. Yeah. No, or just there's there's certain things that um, we wouldn't get away with. Like Seth makes a lot of like gay jokes or right. there's a lot of things that are just really not. Although, you know, sometimes shows, that doesn't mean that, um, you know, we can we can discuss it and reflect about it. At totally. the time, things that's, you know. Things were different. Yeah. But that would be something. And, you well, know, what I don't. About, what about Caitlin's first scene where she's describing the new neighbor? Like, I don't. Oh, think yeah. you could, you know, there's a lot of stereotypes and things like that. Yeah, like, she's like kind know. of profiling him a little bit. Well, she says, um, yeah, she says a Pakistani <laughs> guy and then I saw his shoes, Prada. So, yeah, I, I mean, there's these very, very slight kind of right. vague things that I yeah. guess could be... Um, I would say most writers aren't really writing like that anymore because we're living in a different era. But mm -hmm. I think that's something that then gets caught rather by BSMP by me. Where right. I'm reading a script and I'm like, oh, absolutely not. Like, mm -hmm. this is not, you know, but right. I'd say that does not happen very frequently. Right, right. Well, okay. So, did you, um, when you came in, you noticed that yes. I have the OC board game, right? And one of our listeners um, sent this to us, but you told me that you've played this and you have it. I don't own it myself, oh. but one of my friends in high school oh. had it. And, um, <laughs> I used to like make us play every single time we slept over. I slept at her house in high school and I remember it was really fun. <laughs> Though I have to say I'm now very nervous because sometimes when like, I feel like I'm bad at trivia on the spot. So I'm, oh, I'm nervous I'm going to screw this up. Nothing could be worse than Rachel trying to get thing. me to, to say lyrics or a song <laughs> because of lyrics that I didn't know. Oh my so, God. No worries. To guess a song from lyrics. Good Lord. <laughs> it was Wait, cringe. but did I tell you guys? What? In the closet up here where I am in Canada, I found we have the OC game. Oh my God. No did way. I show this to you? Did I send you a picture? No. That exact game is here because I had it, you know, in 2000. 2007 and it, it's up here. Oh, wow. Okay. So there you go. So you really, I really believe that you don't remember things. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> so I was just going to do some random yeah. questions All for right. you. I'm I ready. Mean, I don't have them for don't Rachel blame there. Me if I, but, yeah. Okay. Well, this one's an easy one. <laughs> so what does Sandy call the women of Newport Beach? Noopsies. There you go. Thank God I, my heart's beating so fast. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> I'm going to be, uh, but that one's good. What California <laughs> town did Julie Cooper actually come from? Oh, Riverside. Very good. <laughs> he basically called me white trash. He said I was from Riverside. What kind of work did Ryan do for two summers before coming to Newport? Before coming to Newport? I was going to say construction, but yeah, I feel like that no, was but, after. But he did it after. I don't know. This this one feels obscure. Yeah, he did it before and after, oh, apparently. Okay. Construction then. Yeah. Ryan's uh, one true passion. Very good. Yeah. yeah. That's what I would have said. Who did Kirsten date before marrying Sandy? Jimmy. Okay, there you go. She's like... These oh. are easier than what you guys usually do on the podcast. Oh. <laughs> well, I got to get something hard here. Um, Give her a hard one. Sometimes it's like, what song was this one episode in? I was like, should I study some of this? Oh my gosh. Okay. Right. What does Paris Hilton <laughs> say is the autograph of the 21st century? A picture? A camera... Oh my god, I can't speak. A cell phone picture. Yeah. Right? A camera phone. I was says. like, I know there was like a, a camera. I was like, what do we call phones? In I know. Well, we, it, we don't use that term anymore. Exactly. A camera phone. Yeah. We just use phones. Oh, I, I was going to say selfie, but that's not it. Yeah, that's <laughs> term of the future. What two dishes do Jimmy and Sandy serve to the Philharmonic board members? Oh my god, I literally couldn't even guess. <laughs> When they were trying to get there, they were trying to impress them to get them to do their um, their restaurant. Like fish? <laughs> it was um, their mother's meatloaf recipes. Oh my God, yes. <laughs> okay, there you go. I don't eat meat, so maybe that one just uh, went over yeah. my head. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, Deb, this has been so fun. And Rachel, when are you getting your ass back here? I'm back. I'm back for our next one. I'm okay, so <laughs> sorry. I know it was so awkward, but I'm so happy. Deb, thank you for coming in. I'm sorry I was on a computer. Oh my God. This was literally like bucket list highlight of my life. I can't even Aww. tell you guys how happy I was to be here. Thank you for having me. Oh my gosh. It's such a pleasure. And thank you for reaching Aww. out and being and listening to the podcast and supporting and and helping us with our work in other ways. We, it's nice to have 
nice to, nice to have people at the network. Yes, let's <laughs> keep in touch. I'll put you guys in whatever I can. Okay, yay. I love that. We love work, don't we, Rachel? Love it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all so much for listening. Please follow, rate, and review. Welcome to the OC Bitches, wherever you listen to your podcast. And if you like to watch us, check it out on YouTube. Bye, bitches. Bye. 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 Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to start with the pilot episode and catch all of our episode recaps.